Bill Merchant, historian and curator here at the D&H Canal Historical Society. Our museum here at 23 Mohunk Road in High Falls will be closed in two years, so we created the Virtual Museum, short three to seven minute segments that will tour you through this museum while we still can. I hope you enjoy. The D&H Canal Company had a particular problem. Well, they had multiple problems transporting their coal. Originally, the Wurtz brothers sold in their adopted hometown of Philadelphia, but their costs of transportation were so great they couldn't compete with the closer coal, the closer anthracite coming from the school kill in Lehigh Valleys. So that is what led the brothers to decide that they needed to build a canal. But the start of navigation, Honesdale, named after their first president, was actually 17 miles from their mines in what was dubbed in 1823 Carbondale, New York. I love the names they had back in the day, eh? And they had about 800 foot of the Musick Mountains. I don't know if you can tell looking at this topographic map, but the Musick Mountains, there's Honesdale, and there's Carbondale up about halfway up the Musick Mountains there. They had uh, talked about trying to do some sort of water elevator and stuff, but that would have been pretty difficult. You'd need a source of water at the top of the mountain, wouldn't you? So they built their gravity railroad. John Jervis, second engineer, second chief engineer of the D&H Canal Company, designed what they called a gravity railroad. Why'd they call it a gravity railroad, folks? It's because they connected all the cars. The cars were connected the entire 17-mile run, and they used the weight of the laden cars, four tons a piece of, of coal in each car, they used the weight of those laden cars going down the mountain to pull the other cars up. John Jervis originally wanted them to use steel, excuse me, iron. Steel doesn't really come about until 1850. Iron chain, but they had problems with breakage. And boy, if you've got multiple cars with four tons of coal on them and the chain breaks, you're really in kind of, you know, that's a problem. Uh, so he had to quickly go over to hemp rope, at least hemp rope frayed, and let you know before it failed. In fact, in their 1830 annual report, there's some $4,000 largely reserved for hemp rope on the Gravity Railroad. The Wurtz brothers were good Quakers, and so this canal had the distinction of not operating on Sundays. They close every Sunday. So the Gravity Railroad, at the end of the day, on every Saturday, somebody had to go out, probably multiple workers, and take down 17 miles of hemp rope uh, and put it back up on Monday morning. Presumably this was to, to, to extend the life of uh, that very expensive rope. Well, this wasn't going to do. By 1844, there was an interesting gentleman, a German immigrant. America really has a lot to, to thank Im immigrants for. John Roebling is a German immigrant who moved to America originally to be in agriculture. He was going to start a sheep farm. But uh, that didn't pan out, so he started making wire rope. He had studied, studied civil engineering in Germany, and they had talked about making rope out of wire, but John, John Roebling actually started doing it, first in his farm in western Pennsylvania, eventually in Camden, New Jersey. Uh, he successfully built wire rope in some of the very first uses, users, I should say, of this rope was gravity railroads. So after 1844, they convert the gravity to wire rope, and they don't have any more problems with it. There's also another first. The D&H was the first million-dollar private enterprise in American history. But it also has the distinction of having run the first steam locomotive in the USA, the Starbridge Lion. So in 1828, a young engineer by the name of Horatio Allen, who had been working for the canal company, Decides, <clears throat> nuts to that, railroads are the coming thing, and he goes over to England. While he's there, the company has him arranged to buy two-inch by half-inch iron strapping. Let me see if I can show you this piece of strapping. This is a piece, probably not original, but this is a piece that was on the gravity. Um, the gravity railroad was hemlock stringers with these metal strapping, as you can see on this wonderful model right here. While Horatio was there, he also saw the, the, the new steam engines that were being built, and the canal company had him arranged to purchase four of them from two different manufacturers. 
And the Starbridge Lion comes over, forget the exact date, uh, and also one called the America. They were from two different makers, probably trying out different stuff. It was a, a, in its infancy. They were both unpacked in New York City, and in consecutive days at different foundries, people came from far and wide simply to see a steam engine up on blocks spin its wheels. Those were simpler times. The America exploded in early tests. It's interesting to note that um, something that seems obvious isn't necessarily so. The pressure relief valve wasn't invented until the 1850s, and prior to that, steam engines blew up promiscuously. And that's what happened to the America. It exploded, turned to shrapnel. Something close to $4,000 gone. The Storbridge Lion was put on a boat, taken to Honesdale, and it made a run. And in fact, Horatio Allen, even though he didn't work for the company, on August 8, 1829, he performed the test run. Well, it was creaking and making a lot of noise and seemed a little unsafe. Well, John Jervis had designed these tracks to carry five tons of weight. And the big problem was that the Starbridge Lion wound up seven tons in Honesdale. History doesn't tell us exactly why. There's a lot of speculation. So here's my speculation, which I think is close to the truth. I like to say that the Starbridge Lion was seven tons in Honesdale, but it was only five tons in Starbridge where it was built. Any guesses? The imperial system. Research indicates that five imperial tons in 1828 were seven tons. I think it was an honest mistake. And I like to point out to people, lest you say, oh, that couldn't happen, that we had a similar thing with the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, somebody made something that was supposed to be in metric or vice versa, uh, didn't discover it till the thing was up in, in space, and they had to send a whole special space shuttle just for that. But the D&H eventually moves over a million tons of coal, two million tons if you count other people's coal. They were quite an operation, and they couldn't have done it without the Gravity Railroad, which actually underwent five iterations, making it more and more efficient. It eventually becomes a, a public attraction. People actually start taking rides. They do regular passenger service by 1872, and it becomes popular to go to the top of the Moosic Mountains, a town they called Farview. Again, one of those wonderful names, eh? People would have picnics. At one point, there was a a natural philosopher who was going to go up in a hot air balloon and parachute down. Weather put the kibbutz on that, but they ended up doing it out of Carbondale a few days later. Uh, basically, these gravity railroads began the amusement park industry. And the canal company, as late as 1930, when they're now just a railroad, operated three steamboats on Lake George, where one of their railroads had a station. Uh, so they stayed in the entertainment business as well as being a coal company, and they started the amusement park, uh, this particular gravity and the other three or four gravity railroads of Pennsylvania. Thank you so much for joining us in our virtual tour. New episodes will be put up every week. Hope you enjoy.